So welcome. And I'd like to say welcome also where, my, where our cameras to, we have colleagues at um, JLC sites, I think in Petten, in Gale, in Ispra, and Karlsruhe. And also we have one person in Luxembourg, a particular session on um, ethical leadership, or leadership and ethical issues. Um, we have invested in the last couple of years a fair amount of resource uh, on the issue of ethics. And uh, we have started, probably quite rightly, in terms of very much the sort of rule and regulation business and what we shouldn't do and what we should do, etc., etc. Welcome. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Good. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. I've just run out of another conference which was packed, standing room only. Uh, this one was on uh, work-life balance. Who was at that particular event? One or two of you were. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so... What I want to do is look at a, an issue which, I, which is, I believe, of fundamental seriousness to the future of our world, not just the future of the European Commission. Okay, let me explain a little bit about what I do, and then, then, uh, then, we'll, then we'll hopefully do something which is, I hope, profound, but also enjoyable. I, I lecture to many of the largest corporations in the world. They range from people like Google to Microsoft to IBM or um, ExxonMobil or, or whoever on a very broad range of issues and I'm a regular visitor here to the European Commission. And most of my interactions with the EU are tangential. Um, European Commission people turning up to meetings where I am on some other site, and occasionally I'm here. But I have deep respect for what you do. I think that what you're doing is an amazing job in a difficult and complex and rapidly changing world, and I want to look at some of the pressures of that. My job is to look at the outer edge of this radar screen, most strategy and policy is about the center. The outer edge is about what's changing in our world. It's about the small things that become tomorrow's trends, the things that can catch us unaware, the low probability but potentially high impact risks that come crashing into strategy, and the unforeseen, unexpected consequences of some very cleverly crafted piece of legislation. That's my job. And one of the reasons why I'm so pleased about what you do is because as far as I'm concerned, you bridge, help us to bridge the gap between the globalization, the global village, and uh, uh, global governance. What do I mean by that? We live in a crazy world where it's almost impossible still to stop spam from being sent. We're slowly getting on top of it, but legally it's very difficult because we do not have transnational legal structures to cope with it. Global warming is another issue. All kinds of issues uh, flounder because we don't have a global governance for our global village. And the reason why I think the European Union is particularly important in this regard is that you have shown how it is possible to weld together a regional governance that's effective. And that gives us hope that we could do it beyond. And I think that's of fundamental importance for our future. One thing that we know, one driver beyond all drivers of the future is emotion rather than legislation or facts or science. Let me give you an example. People ask me about the future of global warming and green technology and I'll tell them it's nothing to do with the science. The science is simply a best guess by your advisors on what world will be like when you're dead. Event 2050, 2060, 2070. They may be right, they may be wrong. You can have your own opinion about the confidence with which you can, that you can give to those forecasts. But it's ultimately irrelevant in answering the question about the future of green tech. The person who's asking about the future of green tech is also asking about the future of European Union legislation about it, um, taxation and incentives and the rest, and their time frame is probably three to five years, correct? Maybe five to ten at the most. But we've just said that the science is only a guide to life in 2050. It's a best guess. So if you want to know the answer about the future of green tech, it's going to be increasingly influenced by the emotions of people, the passions of people, in their interpretation of the science. The science could be wrong. But if the passions of people are that it's probably right, then that will drive all the legislation whether you agree with it or not. So. Emotion is really important, and I have to say, when it comes to leadership, you cannot lead without emotion. Now, we find that difficult. Those of us who love data, as I do, who love Excel spreadsheet numbers, who love processes and procedures and policies and detail, 
it is hard for us to be forced to the fact that leadership requires emotion. After all, robots have data. Robots can, are intelligent. You can make them intelligent. Computer programs can produce all compelling arguments, but compelling arguments do not produce leadership. Leadership comes from passion. Leadership comes, what's your name? Forgo. Leadership comes because people connect with the vision that Forgo has. They look in his eyes and they say, I want to follow him. Leadership cannot come because of his position. I'll come back to that in a moment. Leadership cannot come from position in an organization except in a dictatorship where it comes through fear. I'll explain that. One of the really challenges, big challenges for us is the issue of trust in our world. The subprime crisis eroded what further trust, what tiny bit of trust there was left in banks. In my country, in Britain, we're coming to a general election. There is a challenge for Gordon Brown and Cameron. Only one in ten of my country believes what they say is true. 90% believe that they're lying every time they open their mouths. That's the problem. What is the point of publishing a manifesto if 90% of the country believe it's a pack of lies? In many other countries, we have a similar crisis of confidence in political leadership. It shows itself in other areas. If you have, say, a food crisis, so let's say another dioxin scandal in this country. When the dioxin scandal hit, a friend of mine who made chickens in Italy had to kill three million chickens over a single weekend. Why? Because someone had said, said in the media that the, that the contaminated chicken feed from a dioxin contaminated factory here had got to Italy and it got into the food chain. It was complete nonsense. The future is not about the truth. It's about emotion. He killed three million chickens and threw them away for no reason whatsoever. In one moment, in one mo he built his brand in 30 years and in 24 hours the trust in his brand was completely destroyed. It's an unfair world. So when we're talking about trust within the European Union, trust within Parliament, trust of a medical advisor, it's very easy to lose it, very hard to win it. And when you really want it, is the time it's hardest to get. I'll give you an example. That, that crisis, you could have the agricultural minister in Brussels getting on the television every night. Do you think Italians will believe him? No. Why? Because they say, well, he would say that, wouldn't he? He's protecting the Belgian food industry. You can get the, Ita the Italian food minister on the TV. Will anyone believe him? No. Why? He would say that, wouldn't he? To protect Italian chickens. You so say you get the European food commissioner on the TV. Will he believe? No. Why? Same thing. Well, he's not gunning for Belgium. He's not gunning for Italy, so why would he not be telling the truth? Not sure, but he's just a politician. <laughs> you see where I'm going on this? Trust is fundamental. Without trust, you cannot rule. You get chaos, and I promise you, in a Twitterized world, it's got worse. I have 27,000 people following me on Twitter. I have been tweeting them about this meeting. I asked 27,000 people, what would you say to the European Commission about rebuilding trust in our institutions? And I wouldn't want to repeat all the tweets I got back. But what you need to know is, those tweets got retweeted. Who's here is on Twitter? <laughs> My friends, at the speed of light, at the speed of light, those messages got retweeted. Dump, 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 dump. One person retweeted another thousand another thousand to two thousand, and all the answers come flooding back. What happens is, if there's an issue of trust, or rather mistrust, it spreads very fast through media like that. When I post on Twitter, it also goes to 600 people on my Facebook account who retweet. It goes to 700 people on LinkedIn. Who hears on LinkedIn? Who hears on Facebook? These are the networks of tomorrow. These are the ways in which trust or mistrust spreads fast. And so if we're going to produce a leadership worth following, 
we're going to have to consider the impact of these kinds of things. Here is an ethical question. You want to say something? Yes. You may. Yes. Can you define emotion? Yeah. I just repeat the question. The question is, for those on the different sites, is can you define what you mean by emotion? When I say the future is about emotion, I mean everything other than logic. Okay? So I mean everything from the heart, everything that you feel. Uh, some people are going to complain at the end of this session. They could say, they're going to say, I wish I was expecting EU style someone to do this. And, uh, you know, you talk like this. The trouble is, he was too emotional. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about passion. I'm talking about the things that make your blood boil. I'm talking about the things that you live for and would be willing to die for. That's emotion. And robots don't do it very well, but it's the source of all leadership. Without it, you cannot lead. Here is an eth ethical question. It's about green tech. Last year, a quarter of the entire U.S. green harvest was burnt in vehicles. Put your hands up if you knew that. As part of European, following, part, uh, part of European policy, this year, 5% of all the miles that you do in your vehicle will be done by burning food. That's European policy, and someone... Oh, you think it's higher? It's gone higher. No, 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 no. Sorry to, to, to intervene, but, you know, the biofuel doesn't necessarily mean... Uh, oh, yes, I know. It's wonderful. I'm so glad you pointed that out. You know, there's more to biofuels than food. That's correct. Do you know what proportion of the biofuel this year will come from things other than food? Almost zero. Almost zero. 25% of all U.S. food crop was burnt in vehicles last year. U.S. grain. Why? Because the U.S. president said, you know, there's more to biofuels than burning food. That's correct. But it takes a lot of food. The year before, we saw one of the largest food spikes our world has ever seen. Prices let by 80% and then more. I gave a lecture to 500 people from the Pentagon in that year talking about new pressures, new threats to global instability around the world. In the previous few weeks, there had been riots about because of food prices in 33 nations and one government had fallen. Connection? Maybe, maybe not. The UN itself put out a press release which said this. The United States and the European Union have taken a criminal path by contributing to explosive rise in global food prices for using food crops to produce biofuels. That was the UN's own press release. Correct? Who cares? I said the future is not about the truth, it's about emotion. I can tell you that a statement like that could well have contributed to some of those riots on the streets. Ethical questions, we face them every day. I have to give my own view on this particular thing. To connect food prices or even other sources of bio, which includes cutting down forests and putting them into cars or um, uh, sowing uh, uh, or, or biomass, which is great, great way of, you know, non-food crops. So what you do is you stop growing wheat altogether. You start growing a crop which is so useless, no one can think of anything to do with it except burning it in vehicles. And in that nanosecond, you've created a connection between the global price of oil and the global price of land. And as oil prices rise, land, use price, land, right, price, land prices rise, which means the value of a forest cut down rises, which encourages deforestation and the rest. And you land up with complexities which we never imagined when the European Union passed that piece of disastrous regulation. And nor did President Bush imagine. And what's more, it's nearly history. It will be gone. Why? How can one defend? How can one defend such a policy? If, oil price, if food prices start to spike again, as they already are. Ethical issues. Now we can have eth ethical issues outside an organization, but ethical issues inside too. We talk about European Union confidence within itself. Only 43% of people even bother to turn out to vote for a European politician. And as I say, what's the point when only a very few believe in what politicians should say? In 1995, I wrote a book called The Truth About Westminster. 
I ha my position is, if it's truth about my government, my position is that the vast majority of people in political life are honourable, people with integrity, passion, wanting to build a better world, but something can happen to them which causes them to be compromised in some way. Through the processes of power, they are humans and the pressures are enormous. On my very first day interviewing for the book, I had a former government minister, a prominent minister from my, gov from my UK government, confess to me on a tape things he'd never said to another human being before, except one or two inside his own government, his own wife and his son. Things which caused him to consider resigning. Things which, in fact, went back through several generations. There were things that had been there in government for the last 18 years through both Labour and Conservative parties. He had inherited them, questioned them. He said to me, in a dictatorship, I would have been bumped off because I knew too much. I don't think he's that unusual because my second or third interview on another tape, which also went into a bank vault, was of a similar nature. These issues are complicated, they often last a very long time. There's a fundamental dishonesty that runs at the heart of political systems, at least in my country. You see, I can't think of an example where a politician has led a, a party to victory on the basis of a whole load of manifestos saying we're against this, against that, we oppose that legislation, we thought that legislation was morally wrong, and when we come to power, we will reverse it. I can hardly think of an example where the parliament has changed and the, and the policy has been reversed. Can you think of one? Put your hands up. It's rare. It's unusual. What that tells me is the truth about politics, which is actually behind the scenes over a glass of wine, as you discover if you know them well as friends, as I do, that most politicians are very reasonable people. And actually they do have, on the whole, the best interest of the, most of the community in, in mind. And they fundamentally agree on most things, because most things are matters of common sense. And you might have disagreements around the edges of policy, but the fundamental basis of the future of the European Union is on the whole agreed. Thank God for that. Otherwise, the European Commission would have a very great challenge on its hands. And that, of course, is you are a stabilizing influence. Whoever comes in, you outlive them all. My father was a civil servant. He worked for every government you could imagine. And he never told me which way he'd ever voted in any election until even the day he died. It was a secret. It was a family secret which way he voted. Because he was a civil servant, he said, my job is to serve the government in power. The good news was, whichever government was in power, never made any difference. I'm not quite sure why, because my dad created the policies, right? <laughs> you know what this is like. So politics is hardly ever reversed, which actually is an ethical question. Because if policies are rarely reversed, then if politicians are being fundamentally dishonest in the TV programs they're doing, then no wonder no one believes them anymore. And that's a problem if you're having to serve those politicians in producing policy. So I'm seeing a death of the old politics, the old left-right, and a rise of single issue activism, a rise of causes driven by small narrow groups driving on agendas, whichever is genetically modified food one day, it could be uh, environment and next, terrorism, child labor, uh, um, uh, tr food, human trafficking, transparency, company integrity, a battle free, whatever the issue is of the day and you handle them all. You say, oh, not another one and off we go. But we live in a world where what was bad has become good What's good has become bad. Ethics is changing. And here's a big problem. You see, I talk to banks about compliance, compliance with EU legislation. So you've got to watch out, you've got to comply. That's true, they spend huge amounts of money, a quarter of my clients are banks. They spend huge amounts of money complying with the latest directive from the European Union. And so do all the rest of my clients. There's only one problem. You know what I say to them? I say compliance is dead. Forget about compliance. Why? Because the EU keeps changing. Every time there's another scandal, there will be another bit of pressure for another piece of legislation. A new regulation will emerge from your department, and they will have to comply again with something new, correct? So my clients are always going to comply with history. They're always out of date. And even if they comply with 
Suppose you worked in, um, let's say, food safety. And it's no good if you're Nestle coming before the European Parliament and being interviewed on business news and say, well, we complied with every regulation that the EU asked us to do. They said, jump, we jumped through the hoop. They said, jump again, we jumped through the hoop. We jumped through every single hoop. We had 100% compliance in every single year. They say, yes, I know, but 50 people died last year. As a result, we're changing the regulations. And what happens is, companies then get judged by today's values, not by yesterday's compliance. I'll give you an example. It's taking of a bribe. Taking of a bribe, as you know, used to be perfectly legal in some European countries until comparatively recently. Or rather, the paying of a bribe. To pay money to a Russian official to get money to build your HQ in Moscow, you used, to, in some EU, EU countries, until maybe 95, 96, 97, you used to be able to sign off such a thing as a legitimate business expense under European law. So we sanitized bribery. In fact, it, uh, th in fact uh, it was part of European th law in those countries that the more you bribe, the more tax back you got. The governments were actually paying you to bribe. It was commercially sensible. In fact, it was the only logical thing to do to protect shareholder value. And then things change. If now... What is your name? Marco. I always trick, pick a friendly face. I hope you don't mind me picking on you. If Marco, suppose, is the head of... Now the chairman of one of the largest banks in the world, and now, now we're interviewing on business news. And I say, Marco, I have here an email copied to you in 1995, it shows that you knew about a payment of $20,000 and then $100,000 and then $1.2 million, Marco. It shows you knew about that in 1995 and you say, I would like to point out that the expenses we paid at the time to those Russian officials were perfectly illegal. We got them signed off in our accounts by Ernst & Young and we got the tax back on them from the government. We have always complied in every respect. Do you think that will help Marco's reputation? Put your hands up if you think that Marco will still be in his job next year. Of course not. Therefore, we understand that 100% compliance will not protect Marco's brand. It will not protect Marco's career. It will not build Marco's trust. Trust in Marco. And is useless. The only thing it will do is keep Marco out of prison. So compliance with EU regulation is a wonderful way to stay out of prison. But it does nothing else. It's, it is quite important, yes. But actually, I'd like to do more. See, so what we're saying to a company is, if you want to do well, you have to look beyond where the EU is legislating now. We have to think about what kind of world people might expect you to be trading in in four or five years' time. That's what ethical leadership is about. Unethical leadership is simply running by the book. Unethical leadership has no rules of its own except the rules that are imposed from Brussels. If someone says, well, we comply, I say, so what are your values? Well, my values are irrelevant. We just comply with the regulations. So you have no moral code of your own. See, that's what would happen to Marco. See, poor old Marco will be destroyed in the TV interview because someone will say, so, forgive me for using, um, um, so someone would say to Marco, so, do you think it's a good idea to pay bribes? He's the chairman of a huge bank. What does he say? He says, well, times have changed. Have they changed, Marco? No. Have your moral code changed? Have you had a spiritual revolution? <laughs> or do you secretly think, as you did then, that paying a bribe is a jolly good idea? Marco, if you discovered someone had done a similar thing last week, would you report them to the police and see them put in prison? Marco says, well, they're not complying with uh, existing regulation, and, and I think they should be... I, I, I think um, I've, he's on live TV. I think, um, I think that's a complex question. You say, Marco, yes or no? Well, of course, uh, any, then he, he thinks about policy. We have a policy that anybody who's found to break the law is, of course, supported to the authorities. Thank you very much. So you would put him in prison. You would report him to the authorities and put him in prison, Marco. You say, well, it's not me putting him in prison, but of course, you know, he probably would go to prison for a very long time. Marco... He would go to prison today for doing exactly your example yesterday. 
Would you like to consider your position as chairman of the bank? Marco resigns there and then on TV, or one hour later. It's finished. So, ethics are changing. And we better not think about compliance for ethics. So please, please, don't think about ethical leadership as adopting the rules of the European Commission. That's absolute nonsense. To say, I live by the rules of the EU Commission, is to say you have no ethics of your own at all. You simply follow the rules to stay out of prison. We only have ethics when we go beyond what is required of us and we say, this is the ground on which I stand. This is the kind of leadership I am proud to follow and I want to lead in a way that my children and my children's children would be proud of in the future. And that's quite a different thing. So whose ethics, whose values? Well, I want to suggest to you that just about every ethic comes down to one statement, a four-word phrase and underpins the whole of government. A four-word phrase. I've been offering a competition. I've been testing this statement. I started in MBAs and I didn't lose any money. I said, I'm going to offer a thousand pounds to anyone that can break this four-word phrase. I didn't lose any money, so I increased it to ten thousand pounds. It's now become twenty thousand euros. It's a competition run on my website and I've not lost any money yet. There's only one prize and you can win it tonight. I'll give it away to charity of your choice. It's not for you. And here's the prize. You have to think of a way of motivating people, a, a law that works, um, a way of managing, a way of selling product that's based on a, a mission statement, a political agenda. That is a, an effective leadership speech that works. That is based on anything other than this same four-word phrase. And this four-word phrase is... Well, it's not that one. <laughs> the forward phrase is building a better world. Building a better world. Every leadership speech, every leadership speech, and it doesn't matter whether it's Stalin or Hitler, sadly, it's the same. Mao Zedong, the same. Nelson Mandela, the same. JFK, the same. Winston Churchill, the same. Every leader who's ever lived, who's been effective, has made the same speech based on four-word phrase. The four-word phrase goes a bit like this. You have to imagine 25,000 people here. But it's based on ethics. You may not like the ethics, but it's based on ethics. It goes a bit like this. Follow me, because I believe that together we can build a better kind of tomorrow. For you, for your family and those that you care for, for those in our communities, our cities and streets, for those in the rural areas and those in the cities, for teachers and doctors, for business leaders and whoever they are, for every part of our nation and our great nation, and for the wider benefit of humankind. Together, I believe that we can build a safer, more prosperous and all the rest of it kind of future. And then if you're American, and forgive me, if you are, something gets added. In God we trust, and then may God bless, and so on. And at that point you get the round of applause. That is the only speech that works. And unfortunately, the most wicked of dictators use the same one. They really do. They say, follow me. Why? For the sake of you and for your children. For your family and those that you care about. For our communities. For our neighborhoods, for our cities and our streets. For our nation, and for the wider benefit of humanity. This is the way for our world and together we will build a better kind of future and every dictator however evil they are has used the same agenda appealing to ethics and it's the same ethic the same fundamental ethic that runs through we are hardwired in it's within our genetic code to improve someone else's world strange the only people that that message doesn't appeal to are psychopaths who are only interested in their own world. But even there, psychopaths, most of them, won't kill their own grannies or their mothers. They sort of tail off on the edge when they go into the outer circles of wider humanity. So ethical leadership will always appeal to the highest good. And if we're to win trust, we have to show that we're beyond naked self-interest that we're concerned for the people around us, and we have an agenda that goes way beyond even our own personal links. 
and that we're willing to pay a price for the right thing even when it may disadvantage us personally. And that is the fundamental characteristic of leadership that's worth following. And that's about accountability, transparency and the rest. One of the things that worries me, the European Commission is huge. And some people have said to me, you know, we're kind of a world of our own. Others have said to me, especially on this business of work-life balance, you know, no one can afford to leave. Golden handcuffs. People don't leave. Have you heard that? Put your hands up if you've heard that phrase. People don't leave. One of the reasons that worries me is because in history, organizations that people don't leave or can't leave are usually corrupt. Why? Why are they usually corrupt? If you're in an organization that sucks you in and promises you everything that you could possibly want so that you can't leave, why do such organizations in historical terms usually end up being corrupt? You've gone very quiet. Because power, yes, power gets concentrated. How can you defy the organization? If the organization has power to make or break your career, to destroy your family wealth, to make you destitute having made you unemployable, how can you resist if you have a boss which is pushing you in a way which is borderline unethical or perhaps immoral. I'm not saying that would of course apply to anyone in this room. But I'm saying historically that is a pressure. If you have a group of people who cannot leave, who have to walk together, where if you cross the boss you'll be destroyed for the rest of your life, that is, I'm just saying, there's a, there's a moral vulnerability there. And organizations that are strong enough to survive external force are invariably corrupt. When it's, they're strong enough to survive internal pressure, because they've neutered the internal pressure, anyone that's got any, any, any you know, spike in them to make a problem, we, we neuter them. And an organization that is strong enough to withstand a media attack from outside is even more likely to drift into unethical behaviors. Now, of course, I'm sure there's never been a case of unethical behavior of any kind within the European Commission. So what is leadership then? It, it, a multi, let me give you a good example. A multinational company which has given huge golden handcuffs, locked you in with share options, I would say many of those executives are ethically compromised. Correct. A multinational company that's operating in the global marketplace where it's got a free flow of people from their competitors and all the rest of it, the people will not be ethically compromised. Because they say, life's too short. I'm not going to work for this guy anymore. I'll go and work for someone else. But if you're tied in with over-generous incentives which make it almost impossible for you to leave, yes, you are compromised. By definition, you are. Absolutely right. Um, and uh, so leadership never comes from position. Let me prove it to you. Uh, imagine there was a president of the world going to be elected and we're looking for nominations. I've been, looking, I've been carrying out this nominations process for 50,000 people over the last five years. I speak to up to 4,500 people at a time, so I'm able to poll lots of people. So I'm interested in nominations. Who would you nominate as part of your shortlist uh, to be considered to be a president of the world that might have a reasonable chance of winning? Can I have a couple of names, please? Mandela. Mandela. There's another one. Dalai Lama. Dalai Lama. Putin. Putin. <laughs> Got three. You know what? Your first choice, I think, is the one who will win. Mandela, I think, wins. The consensus rules. Now, how does he get so popular, this guy? He was in prison for 20 years. He's got no office. He has no official title. He's got no staff, well, one or two. Uh, but basically, how does he do it? He does it by sheer strength of, not hierarchy. He does it 
because of, because people think that he has an agenda which goes beyond himself. They think that he represents values which they believe passionately are morally right. They believe in the vision that he has for humankind. They think that on the whole when he opens his mouth he talks sense. They think that he is sufficiently high, highly, uh, highly motivated that even if, even if he came across something that would disadvantage him financially, he would walk away from it for the sake of the public good, for the sake of the principle. This man has trust. That is ethical leadership. And the wonderful thing about it is that I don't care how junior or senior you are in the EU Commission, that people who shine in that way are deeply respected, greatly feared, because you have huge power. Why? Because you can't be controlled. And you are the, you are the life of the world. Um, a work-life balance is a trivial story, but uh, in comparison. <laughs> um, here's, here's a 40-year-old woman who's fed up with uh, her entire life being trashed by uh, an unsupportive boss. She's got three young children, um, and uh, the work-life balance is dreadful. He's, there's zero understanding of some of the pressures she's under, but she knows she's a high-performing woman. She thinks she's one of the most talented people in the European Commission, <laughs> and she'll have a fantastic future. Um, and I say to her, so why haven't you talked to your boss? Well, I, I don't even tell him we're about to have a fourth child. <laughs> oh. So you're not going to talk to him about reducing your hours from 190 down to 140 a week? I, it would be more than my career's worth. So I say, so you've become an economic slave. She says, how dare you? I'm not an economic slave. I say, yes, you are. You've just told me that they own your soul. They have enslaved you. They have turned you into a slave for money. That they are controlling you, destroying your family, and that you're living a life you don't like and you wouldn't want your children to follow. You're living by values you don't believe in. For money. Because you are afraid that if you leave that organization or you do something that might affect your career, that, that it will have terrible impact on you. She said, well, that's right, I, I am, you're an economic slave. But I said, I've got good news for you. You can get free of your chains. She said, how? I said, believe in yourself. I said, you're gifted, talented. Believe in yourself. Just do your CV and start thinking about who else you could work for. And go to your boss, not with fear in your eye, but with absolute self-confidence, and tell him the truth. And say, Jeremy... I like working for you very much, and I find a lot of purpose here. I think my job in the European Commission is, is wonderful, but you need to know it's not working for me, and I have made a decision, which is it is going to change either inside or outside the organization, and it will change within the next 12 to 16 weeks. So I am actually unofficially giving in my resignation. I will be looking for a new job uh, as from September. I might be persuaded to stay, but if only on the following conditions. I say, well, what are those? The conditions are, I'm only prepared to work three and a half days a week. The other day and a half, I will be available by BlackBerry and by mobile phone. I will probably be more available than you because you're in meetings all day. Um, and uh, you, so you will find that uh, I will still pay attention to things. Things won't seize up on my desk. But you will find in every week, there will be one and a half days when I will be at home. That's the deal. I said, I could never do that. I mean, he will doubt my commitment. Try it. He, he will ruin my promotion prospects. Try it. Two weeks later, she phones me up. Say, you never guess what? Say, yes, I can guess. You never guess I'm so excited. Yes, 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 tell me. She said, I, I talked to my boss. Yes. And? Well, I, I can't believe it. What? I know the story already. I've heard it so many times now. The boss said, let me think about it. Then he came back the following day. He said, I've not slept a wink all night. Because I suddenly realized how huge your contribution is to our department, and I've realized I've overlooked you for promotion for a very long time. So what I'm proposing to do, if this is okay, is to increase your pay and give you three and a half days a week, and we'll be about quits. I think it'll be about 10 euros difference if you'd be willing to stay, but please don't leave.
What happened was she broke the fear. She became free. She was no longer an economic slave. She got control of her own destiny. She was happy to walk and she gained power. She gained power. Suddenly she's in a powerful negotiating position. People realize her for who she is. And you know what? If a boss doesn't value her, should she stay? Is life worth staying? If, she, if a boss doesn't think she's worth that, if a boss isn't prepared to negotiate with her to keep her in, do you think she should stay? Why? Life's too short. If the boss thinks she's that much rubbish, why bother to waste a single day serving him anymore? And you say, well, life's not like that, Patrick. You know, there's unemployment. That's true, but people don't stay out of jobs that long, and actually life's, life's too short to do things you don't enjoy and don't believe in, isn't it? Put your hands up if you think that's true. Listen, if that's so, work-life balance, it's got to be so if you know of something which is a fundamentally unethical, it's a major, major issue, you, actually it is an issue, then I would suggest the way to break it, one of the ways to break it, is to be prepared to walk. And say, I am prepared to walk. Um, I have considered my exit strategy. If you haven't got an exit strategy from the EU, then I would suggest you already compromise. Now, your exit strategy, you might say, yes, I have got my exit strategy. My exit strategy is to work for a regional outpost of the European Union in Timbuktu. Or another department as far away from Brussels as possible. <laughs> okay. That may be true, but there is, I, there is more to life than the European Commission, thank God for that. Isn't it? Put your hands up if you believe that's true. Yeah. Uh, you know, I heard some people say to me, yes, but we wouldn't get so much money outside the... Uh, hell with the money! You say, well, yeah, yeah, it's all very old for you to say that. No, I'm... There, <laughs> if you're as talented as I think you are, as double gifted, and you, what's more, you've got passion and values, you know what? You could go to a bank. If you'd resigned after uncovering a major problem, they're just the sort of people that HSBC would grab with both hands and put you into a compliance team to comply with EU legislation, what you wrote. Why? Because they know you can't be bent. Why can't you be bent? Because they know that if you came across an issue, you'd complain about it like mad, you'd challenge it like crazy, and if necessary, resign over it, and then talk about it afterwards outside the organisation and say, we need some people like that. May I ask something? Yes. Um, in your experience, did you ever encounter an organization which is ethical? Yes! Hundreds of them. I think you're an ethical organization. Put your hands up if you think you're an ethical person. Come on! Of course, you're an ethical organization. You're passionately full of ethics. You're stuffed full of ethics, so much so that you'd waste a whole afternoon rabbiting and listening to someone like me rabbiting on about this issue. Of course you're an ethical organization. I think that every organization is full of passionate, ethical people. I'm just talking about when something happens within the power structures or the size of the organization that ends up compromising us in a way. And what can we do about it? Because that's the title of this session, isn't it? Ethical leadership. And I'm saying one of the shortcuts to ethical leadership is breaking free. It's saying, I will not be bossed about. I will not do it. Uh, that's how I dealt it with this, this, this slightly mad professor. He knew. I mean, I was, I was continually being asked to do things which I thought were unethical. I, I was being asked to do experiments. I was being asked to do extra tests to help various people complete their PhDs. Tests which reduced old ladies to tears because they'd had so many bloods taken from them by other people they'd run out of veins. They're asking me as a junior doctor to go and spike this woman again and get more blood, and I knew it was actually this woman's dying. She's going to be dead in a month. We're basically watching her die on, on the radar screen of some Excel spreadsheet numbers. I refused. I was the most junior doctor in the whole place. I said, you take them. You don't take the bloods. She's crying in tears down there, even at the thought of me going anywhere near her. And you know what? I couldn't care less if he tried to sack me. I would love it. Why? What a way to lose your career, eh? I'd love to go to the GMC about it and say, I just want you to know why I resigned. Well, actually, uh, I resigned ten minutes before he sacked me. The reason was I had a little old lady in tears in the side room and I was being asked to puncture for blood. Uh, she wasn't being told what the blood was for. She was being told it was for her own treatment, but it was not. It was a complete one of his thesis. What a great thing to do. 
My folks, there's a moral strength that comes from these things. And I just want to encourage us to be, to be, be the people that we <laughs> want to be. Okay, so that's it really. At the end of the day, for me that's what leadership's all about. It's connecting with the passions that people have. It's winning trust. They will only win trust if they believe in our, but they believe that we're prepared to walk. If they don't believe you're prepared to walk, they won't follow you. Because I think at the end of the day, you know what? I don't trust him because I actually think at the end of the day, you could push various things past him and he's too, too, too in love with his job, too wanted to go with the status, uh, too, 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 too unwilling to ruffle anything that quite frankly, I suspect he'd be compromised just like the rest. If someone knows where you stand, they know that you won't budge, you have absolutely unviolable principles, then I believe you'll shine like a star and be a tremendous example worth following. Yes? Um, I, I, hear, I hear what you're saying, but, but rather than um, advocating perhaps a massive walkout of the institutions, um, because we're all very ethical people here, I mean, what are the other solutions um, would you advocate? No, the easy one is, once you said, I'm prepared to leave, you can stay in. That's the joy of it. One, the only way I could change that professor's behavior was by being prepared to look death in the face and say, Sack me. Do you want to sack me? I had this, and, and then he can't do anything. No, but I mean, people, p good people do leave. Yes, and no, I'm not, not advocating that. No. I'll give I, you an I example don't. on the ward, okay? Ward, there I am. Professor turns up, starts shouting at me in front of all the patients. I said, uh, do you want to sack me? Uh, be, be my guest. I'll resign. If you just ask me to resign, I'll resign. Is that what you want me to do? in front of all these witnesses, in front of all these nurses and the patients and the patients' relatives. Please, Professor, be my guest. If you want me to resign, I will resign in the next five minutes. Just say the word. But, uh, but as you said and before, of course you can't. It's, it's not always can't. the big issues, it's the little issues. Of course it is. And okay, to go to the wall on a big issue, well, we could perhaps all understand that. But I mean, it's, it's often... No, it's the little issues that's that. exactly the same. It's the little issues exactly the same. You say, uh, say, I won't put up with that. I don't care who you are, you could be Jesus Christ, I will not put up with that. Do you understand me? And I, it might be, I don't like the way you talk to that employee. I don't like the way you talk to Julie. It's how dare you, I'm your boss. I don't care who you think you are, I won't put up with it. Sack me if you want to. Ask me to resign if you want to, but I should make it exactly clear why it is that we fell out. But I will not work in a department like that. You are a disgrace to the European Commission. <laughs> but that's the way you deal with a little issue. And what happens to that man? He goes beetroot red, and what can he do? He can try and wreck your career, but you've already decided you don't care. And the very fact that you don't care means he can't control you, and he's got nothing against you. Think, oh, what's your name? Sally. She says, ah, that's Sally. I could throttle her. Yes, he could, but he can't. Because you've broken free, because you know you're prepared to walk over a silly thing like that. So you wouldn't resign, Everett. But what you're saying is, he might try and mash up my career, but I'm bigger than him. And what's more, you know what? I'll rise higher than him, and one day I'll be looking down for ten layers up the EU beyond him. Because he's, he's a mess in his personal life, in his, he, the way he handles team, he doesn't even deserve to have the team he has. And when you've got that, that's what I mean by being prepared to walk. It's not mass resignation. It's just being, it's a, it's a mental state. You know, if I could do that as a junior doctor in my first few days in the ward and stand up to a consultant and say, sorry, sorry, Professor, I just want to be clear. Uh, so everybody else hears this as well. Um, I've got 15 people, three of whom are expected to die during the night, who've just been admitted through casualty by ambulance. I've got another eight people on other wards I haven't been able to see for the last six hours and I've been called to see them urgently who are in desperate need of other medical care. And you're asking me as the most junior doctor to run around and do other extra experimental ECG recordings on their chest so you can complete your research plan. I just want to be clear about that because if that is what you want me to do, I will of course stop everything else I'm doing for the next three hours to comply with your request. But I just want to be clear what it is that you're saying. Oh, how could I do that? I could only do that because I couldn't care less. Because I would treat him as an equal, I would not be intimidated by him. 
And I'd say, if I could do that, any of us can do that. We could do it, and, and it's the little things, I think, which matter even more than the big ones. Because I think it's the creep, as you know well, that happens. It's the little expense claim which splits through, then it's the other one. Then it becomes institutionalized, then the whole team's doing it. And then you find the next team's doing it, and now you're in a real mess. Does that make sense? I'm not advocating mass resignations. I'm advocating walking free. <laughs> That's all. Okay, well, our time is over, but can I just conclude? Let me tell you the truth. This is the second scariest assignment I've had to do in the last two years. Because it really matters. I've probably done a hundred of these things in a year, in two years. 4,500 people a time on a big platform. Entertaining, provoking, talking about the future. This really matters to me. I know it really matters to you. What we highlighted, and I think, uh, I have to say again, a big thank you to the electronic thing. I do think that this is one of the few situations where electronic polling actually really, really matters. There were lousy questions, and I apologize. They just, for me, um, made clear that there's another piece of work to be done, which is perhaps on a slightly larger scale, to get some better questions and larger numbers of groups together to try to understand more clearly what the natures of these pressures are to drill down I think I would love to do a, a group of five or six hundred people interestingly if you gather them and it only takes about fifteen minutes to get the result then you can go away and think about it but it seems to me that we're on the edge of something really really important here um, but I just want to encourage you I think the work that you're doing is extremely valuable, it really, really matters, that you have been placed in positions of extraordinary influence and opportunity. And I believe that history always rewards eventually, or usually rewards eventually, men and women of real courage. And it is extraordinary, in my experience, how fortunes get reversed. And you think you've lost every battle. And you think you've trashed your own career. You think you're being loud-mouthed by someone who's more influential, has more access than you, who will never, ever reveal the truth. And the case is lost and then something amazing happens. There's a kind of natural law about it. I just want to encourage you in it. And uh, an extraordinary thing can happen from the smallest thing that you do. You've heard about the 80-20 rule. Most of us probably produce most of the impact of our entire leadership in about a fifth of the time we spend each week. 80% of the impact for 20% of the effort, which is exciting and depressing. But I have to say, taking a moral position, in my experience, can often give you a 90 91 1% of the time in your week that you spend on that issue gives you 99% of the impact of your entire leadership because you win respect. and gain influence. And you give room for similar people of like mind to follow on. So we create space for people to do the right thing in a similar way. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much. It's been great to be with you. And I wish you every success in the future. Thank you. Patrick, many thanks. I had an ethical dilemma halfway through that session thinking, my God, I've just organized something, a mass resignation of the commission. <laughs> no, but thanks very much. I mean, I mean, I said at the start, 
that this is uh, the start of at least three uh, short sessions like this to look at uh, uh, ethics in terms of leadership and management. Uh, and I'm glad the discussion went down to the little things because um, you know, we pick it up ourselves when we look at staff survey data and when we hear things that there are issues that are very, very small that help create um, a culture in, in, in the organization at times that our, our colleagues and staff don't really want. Um, so I'm delighted that we got um, both those things out of the session, the high level stuff about the organization, but also the little things down, down the line. So Patrick, many, many thanks. It's a great pleasure to have you with us today. Tell your colleagues that this thing will also be on our learning channel in an edited version, of course, if they want to pick up on the main elements of uh, what was said by Patrick. So again, maybe another round of thanks for Patrick, who's collapsed here in the corner. <laughs> he's collapsed. Get up. Get up. Get up. Thanks so much. And, um, um, just to say, there's a, there's, a, there's a huge number of resources on these and other issues on my website. If you type my name into Google, you'll find it. 12 million people have been on the globalchange.com site. It's just my own stuff. 2.7 million video views so far on YouTube and other channels. But there's a lot of stuff there on ethical dilemmas, leadership, and the future, which I hope may help in some way. Great. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. Watch out for the next session. Oh, we got some fascinating results in our equipment, didn't we? Yeah, it's worth doing. Whoa, it's good, wasn't it?